Welcome, everyone, to episode 232 of Just Joshing. I am your host, Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff and podcast two today is part one of my two part conversation with Robert Angus. Rob owns the Octavia Book Bindery. I'll give the address at the end. He does an incredible job. Um, I think this episode, more than anything else, is probably one of the best conversations I've had about value on any show I've done. Uh, what is art worth? Because he did, book binding, book book restoration is such a very hands-on, pragmatic art that I think Rob's perspective is really, really insightful. And also, you know, in, and even though it's bare bones, pragmatic in a lot of ways, there's a lot. Like you can tell, Rob definitely loves what he does, takes pride in his work, and also, I mean, just loves books. And what can go wrong with? And how can you not love? Someone like that. So, um, speaking of worse, in literally, um, I'm nervous. I'm kind of nervous saying this, but in like 17 days, my Patreon goes live. I'm kind of really excited about that. I just announced my first sponsor with Words and Pictures. I'm hoping to have some more stuff announced soon. I can't wait. Um, but yeah, let's just get to our conversation with Robert, shall we? <laughs> That's that's all good. That's all good, man. I I, I I can do it too. I can go one way or the other on this. So I always start with this question: If you have anything incriminating you like to say, make it good. Yeah. Incriminating. Incriminating. Um, I gotta admit, you, you are competing with a fifteen-year-old. Ninety-nine percent of the rumors that are out there about me are true. Sweet. Ninety-nine percent of the rumors out there are made up by me. Cool. And. There's a Venn diagram that shows that uh, 1% crossover, which is actually kind of more of a bell curve of 2%. But I just make that shit up as I go, so none of it's real. It's okay. um, I am as much a fictional character as I am a real person. Which I think is true for everybody, outside of making up your own roommates. That sounds, well, like, that I mean, sounds, like, that sounds like a lot of work. The, the, the caveat there is that uh, uh, everything is bullshit until it's proven false. Interesting. And then it's true, because it's bullshit that's proven false. Uh, interesting. Okay. Everybody lies about who they are. Uh, you start dating somebody. Two years in, you find out that they're a totally different person. It's true. You know, and so that's uh, that's kind of the thing. Is everybody puts on this this mask, this air of unreality. Interviews, Facebook posts. Oh sure. Novels. I mean, I, I'm in the middle of writing like four different things right now, and I've published nine, ten books, edited hundreds, thousands, and uh, and at the end of the day, it's still not, doesn't represent anything about who I am, it's just stuff. See, and that's interesting, because I, I, I have a different take on that. I don't, I don't think, like, obviously, I find, I find that stories tell your story, right? It just, not necessarily in the way that... Um, for example, I wrote about a, a, a slave boy that's spying on dragon masters in the tower. That is not what's really happened, but that feeling of being tired of working on my day job um, and being wanting more out of life, that was conveyed in the story, right? There was some a content I really wanted to have. It was something that was true and I wanted to express, and I expressed it in a very fictional way, but at the same token, a very true feeling. It connected. Right, and I find that the best stories tend to actually, or even the best art, the best stories. I mean, there's a genuine connection of something that's genuine about the writer, creator, whatever, that it can be, is conveyed on the page. I don't know. It's uh, it's like acting. If you bring your own personality to the role, then your personality influences what the characters like, and thus the interpretation by the audience. They either like it or they don't. And as an author, I mean, like I say, most of what I write is absolute, utter nonsense. Um, and I would say most of it is just that incriminating, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, if people were to take it for realsies, mm -hmm. then, I mean, God forbid that my personality is influenced that much. I mean, I'm writing, very often I'm writing about scenarios that are just impossible and ridiculous sure like uh you know one of the stories that i wrote was um was uh, uh called this book is shit and it's about a guy who at his first big gala style sort of book launch um ends up having just the, the you know he's sitting on this mohair couch 
and surrounded by geniuses and professors and intelligentsia and you know artists and whatever else like editors and you know agents and whatever and he's surrounded by all these people it's like a dream scene because that doesn't actually happen in real life right mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the the New York and London publishers would love you to think that that's what it's like because it's a, it's a sexy sugar-coated dream but it's not real no you know I mean and so with that in mind it's like um, you got this dream sequence of this, this sort of fancy thing the guy's sitting on this white couch and he's sipping on this like very expensive fancy wine and, and uh, you know and he feels his stomach just do this churning thing and the next thing you know he's shitting all over the fucking place and it goes up the sides of the couch it looks like angels wing right like and, and so he doesn't know what to do he's surrounded by all these like you know fancy prancy people that he's trying to impress and he's covered in his own diarrhea and he starts, like, he drops to the ground and starts flopping around like he's got a grand mal seizure, but he's never seen one before. So he's just, you know, having a grand mal seizure and trying to fake this thing so that he can, like, just have some sort of out, right? Instead of having destroyed this, like, very, very stupidly expensive couch with his diarrhea. And so the rest of the story is just him going through the, the sort of karmic experience of this terrible, terrible moment. Yeah. And it doesn't resolve itself until he goes to this art show several chapters later. And uh, he goes to this art show and it's all about his experience. The couch is right there in the middle of the room as an art piece. And there's photos of him, you know, and this silly fake, you know, tongue sticking out, flopping on the floor, eyes rolled up in the back of his head, glass of wine going everywhere. And that's kind of how I see my art in the grand scheme of things. None of it's real. It's all silly, nonsensical bullshit. But at the same time, if my real life is influenced in any way, well, it's called this book of shit for a reason. Ah. Right? So um, see, I, I don't write anything serious. And at the same time, I'm, I'm often writing about the ridiculous in real life but it's not necessarily my ridiculous. No, n well, I'll give you an example. My current book coming out is about a guy that, that goes to the, the cloud today, becomes our archaeology tomorrow, steals a file in the cloud he shouldn't, and everything after him, including zombie monsters and unicorns that fart rainbows, is after him. I mean, I, I mean, I, I definitely have an appreciation of the absurd. By the way, my unicorn talks in windings. Um, so, I mean, I, I definitely understand that, I mean, there's a certain... Absurdity, I can, I can. Enjoy. God forbid anybody try to psychoanalyze my writing. Yeah. But that said, um, well, no, you know, that's that's just one aspect of, of the art yeah. life around here. Um, being a book bindery, I mean, again, what's the what's the psychology of that? You know, it's such a rare, rare art. You know, I mean, there's, I can only think of. A couple of art forms that are even rarer than that, but especially in this place, I mean, Alberta doesn't. Uh, we've got three book binderies, four book binderies. Yeah. Three of them are in one city that isn't here. The closest bindery to us doesn't actually do anything. Um, you know, she's got a big fancy, <coughs> fancy website, but doesn't take on any jobs, right? And so, it's it's more of an ego thing for her. Um, which good for her, I guess. Yeah. You know what? Anybody can fake it. Oh yeah. You know, she's got a degree, and that's cool. And uh, and she chooses her jobs one or two a year, as far as I hear. Um, and that's cool. But she's not competition. I mean, she's not in the same no. same realm. Um, but with us, I mean, we take on hundreds and hundreds of jobs every year, and uh, a lot of them are like just university students or people getting their Bibles fixed or, um, you know, we just had one client come in that. Uh, that uh, brings these box loads of books asking if they're worth fixing well if he has no sentimental attachment to it then no of course not right I mean what's the point in fixing a book if you can just buy another one on the internet for 10 bucks yeah exactly right like my time is worth something and so if it's going to take me 3-4 hours to do a book this guy only wants to spend ten bucks because he's willing to buy a new, cheaper version he, on the he, internet he, for ten bucks. He wants to buy something disposable. Yeah. Whereas, well, no, not even disposable. I mean, he's he's looking for he's looking for uh, uh, better versions of what he already has, and they're antiques and whatever else. But yeah. in you know, the fact is, is that they're worth ten bucks each. They're not, you know, from a money ex like from a money sort of investment perspective. Nothing. 
the sale value of that piece isn't going to be much. No. Right? Unless he can, like, sell it, sell it for more. Um, at retail, in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other side of it is if he has a sentimental attachment to it, like it was Grandma's copy of The Night Before Christmas, then and he's passing it on to his great-grandkids or something, or grandchildren, or even his own children, um, that has significance to their family. It's got, like, some emotional provenance for them. And is it worth fixing then? Well, it's a piece of grandma, sure, right? A piece of their life story. They're passing on this this kind of yeah. tradition and history. It's their it's their legacy in a sense. Same with the big family Bibles and stuff. I mean, those are important. Yeah, absolutely. But the other side of it is that you've got this this um, monetary interpretation of things. Well, is anything in this day and age that everything is recyclable or reusable or throw awayable or disposable or whatever. I mean, we love books around here. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't really matter what the original value of it was. If you're saving it for another generation and pass it on, then great. You know, that's fantastic. Um, I don't care if it's a if it's a collection of National Geographics you're having bound up into a, a really nice you know, sort of collection of archives. That's fantastic. But One of my favorite book buying jobs, again, I'm a comic book guy, right? So he used to have this run of Silver Age Justice League stories. But the books were all damaged. He actually had them bound into these r really elegant hardcovers. Yeah. I thought that was, I mean, from a collect, comic book collecting point of view, it's not worth a ton of money. But from like just a personal, like, I thought that was one of the neatest things I've ever seen done to a comic. Well, it's not like it's one of the first ten that came off of the assembly line and, and, and was signed by the author. Exactly. And bound and like, put into a plastic baggie and forgotten forever and never read. Yeah. I mean, leave it for 50 years and it's the first copy of Superman. Yeah, of course it's going to be worth a lot of money. Yes. Right? But if it's the first copy of... I don't know. Just some random dude's artwork that nobody's ever heard of and never will. Does it have value? I mean, if yeah. nobody's willing to buy it, then no. No. If it's got some sentimental value for the person, then yeah. I mean, I've got, I've got comic books in my collection. They're fantastic, and like unread, in plastic, mint condition, and not because I like the artist and not because I like the stories, but because. Um, you know, our our experience hanging out in a in a gallery one day, looking at his diorama of his small town, was really neat. Mm -hmm. You know, and so for me, it's just a, a sentimental reminder of that day. Are they valuable? I have no idea. I mean, I I don't know if uh, if his stuff ever launched a career or not. I don't know. But what I can say is that it's a neat little thing in my collection. Yeah. Um, would I bind them up into a book? Not necessarily, because from my perspective, they're kind of neat as they are. But I've never read them or looked in them. Yeah. Well, in this guy's particular case, it was, they were damaged. Mm -hmm. So it was just the idea of restoring them into something that was a reading, a readable book, I thought that was a really neat way of doing it, right? It's not something yeah, I would... Yeah, no, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Um, you know, again, it's... Book binding, ultimately, on, you know, in any perspective, is done for two reasons. One is for one's own legacy, and the other is for um, a sentimental reason. If they're binding it for value, then they're going to do it in an artistic style that increases in value. Yes. And that is questionable to some people as to whether or not it decreases the value or increases the value at all. Right? So, my thought ultimately there is is that um, you know if I'm left to do an artistic interpretation of a binding for a book and I'm doing it for a person's own personal collection that to me has value it is a, an art commission and should be considered and, and insured and evaluated like art right yeah um, I, I suppose it all depends on the insurance guy and you know whether or not they're going to insure it at that price, and whether or not the guy can ever sell his art at that price. That's such an absurd thing to think about that an insurance guy determines art values and so. Well, it's yeah. it, like yeah. somebody's a uh, hand model or an artist's hands or legs or yeah. voice or whatever can be insured for whatever value they're earning with that over their yeah, lifetime, just absolutely. like a career, right? Oh, absolutely. It just it, it just seems it just seems absurd when you actually when you think about uh, that. I was talking to a friend earlier this morning about this uh, this car. I you know 
I had contemplated saving up the money and coming up with a an excuse to buy it because it was in itself a a uh, an investment. Mm-hmm. The car had never been driven. It was a Shelby. It was uh, you know this beautiful design car, um, brushed aluminum. It was at the time like 15 years ago, um, up for sale for 200 thousand. But it had never been driven. It was a show car. And every show that it goes to, it just, you know, it's rented, basically. I mean, it's it's rented to display. And, you know, it earns money every year. Yeah. Right? The value in that respect is, is a business value, so you can insure it against that, right? Um, if I was ever to take that car out and change the headers and, uh, and fix the motor and make it run on our current style of gasoline, then would that decrease the value? Sure, for some people. If it's still got nine kilometers on the, or sorry, nine miles on the on the autometer, and it's drivable at this point, there's probably some asshat out there that wants to drive it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, and that's you know they might pay for it in that respect. It's it's got provenance. It was built by Shelby himself, and it's a uh, it's a showpiece. It's gorgeous. You know, if you wanted to uh, to crack the wrapper, then uh, by all means. I mean, whatever. It's like a fifty year old car. Yeah, absolutely. But. When it comes to books, I mean, I love books. Yes. And I love reading books. I love collecting books. I love the experience of books. I love watching book auctions. I love sometimes even bidding on books. I haven't in years. But, you know, I, I download the, the Sotheby's and Christie's catalogs whenever books show up in their collections just to look at them and see what they've got and see what's happened on the, on the markets. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, a book is worth as much as somebody's willing to pay for it. Absolutely. And that... In, Includes the insurable value. Yeah. But that's what I do is that we, we love books, we make books, we fix books. And again, to get back to the original part of this thing was the you know, sort of the psychological interpretation of one's art. Well, it's very utilitarian. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you look on it from the trade perspective, trade binding perspective, just the basic restoration stuff and the basic rebinding stuff and the basic thesis binding or hardcover bindings are like, you know, there's not that much special about it. It's a very, very, very difficult and exacting art. And it's different, for example, than writing something and being able to interpret that writing in a sort of Northrop Fry perspective or a linguistic perspective or a literary sort of take it apart and see what he's trying to say or see what he's written but there's not really a whole lot to say about you know the the style of thing except the attempt to make something so perfect that the client will tip you yes right i mean um there's no more degrees for these in canada there's no more there's no more person, um, you know, from a from a career perspective, that can tell you that you're a master or an apprentice or a journeyman um, bookbinder because every place does it differently, and every place, you know, you're either on the the snooty end of things saying that uh, nobody's good enough because they don't have the same degree as you or they're not a member of this association or that association. Or which is amusing to me. Well, it's, it's it's a it's a form of snobbery. Yeah, absolutely, and it's, absolutely. And it's, you know, my team versus your team. But then the other side of it is, is you got trade binders like my mentor, who was raised in it. Uh, the bindery was started on his birthday in 1926, like when he was born. His grandfather, his father, put it together, and and on they go. He takes it over. He was 80 some odd years old when I took over from him, and he's already got three generations of kids that he's raised and who've moved on with their lives that don't want to be bookbinders, right? Like, it went three generations in his family out of seven generations of time, and what now? He passes it on to me, right? And I was already doing fancy stuff, but, you know, he wasn't a fine binder. He was a trade binder. Had lots of cool machines, most of which got lost eventually, but, um, you know, he was good at making thesis and newspaper covers and and uh, piano binders and things like that, but he didn't do fancy leather work. You know, he didn't do um, high-end repairs or restorations. Um, he'd rebind an old family Bible with buckram, which was 
incredibly freaky to me to notice, right? And I was like, what are you doing? Not in my, not in my studio, you don't. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, he was retiring. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, the, the new guard takes over for the old guard and um, fixes their work. Yeah, and I'll also, also you have your own ideas of how you want to do things, and you did it that way. And if anyone takes over for you, they're going to do the same thing to you. Um, well, fortunately, the person taking over for me, if uh, if she outlives me, I hope. Um, <laughs> I think I'll hold it. Hey, you know. Yeah, hey, I'm not. I'm not but, I, yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what it, from my perspective, what it comes down to is that. I am trying already to replace myself. I'm pre- mm. not preparing for dying or anything. No. But I'm trying to prepare to replace myself so that the community still has somebody doing this work at a high level. Yes. And then able to teach other people to continue the process. And it's not just finding somebody to replace me in the studio. No. Or to replace me in this company. Um, because I mean, this company's gone through three name changes since 1926, before 1926. Um, as I understand the story, uh, Mr. Knight, K Knight, uh, K N I G H T, um, was the first bookbinder in Calgary, or one of the first bookbinders in Calgary. And um, I've had the honor of fixing a couple of his books, but he was the person that Mr. Hertzsprung, the the first Hertzsprung. Um, had uh, in, well the first Hertzsprung the first Hertzsprung that ran Calgary Bindery um, had worked for him and apprenticed with him but he had already apprenticed in Germany or where, uh, wherever they were Europe somewhere um, and when he came to Canada he worked with Mr. Knight I don't know when exactly Mr. Knight retired but these guys started their own bindery in 1926 and got the equipment got the machinery started setting up and for the next you know many years, it's been 90 years since, they went from Knight's Bindery to Calgary Book Bindery, and that state of Calgary Book Bindery limited, oh gosh, forever. And then from there, um, when I bought them out in 2008, um, I just kept my name because I was already known for doing stuff. And so I took over the client lists, I bought the equipment off of them, and he came in and rented studio space and paid off what I owed him. Right. So over the next four or five years, he really just paid off the debt that I owed him with studio rental time, right? Because he didn't like retirement. He didn't like not working. No. So no, which I which is understandable because after, if you do something for a long enough time, you just you just get used to doing it. He just needed something to do. Yeah. He's, he's in his 80s and he's uh, and he doesn't want to sit around the house doing nothing. No. It, right? it, 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 that, so that that'll kill you quick. Drives his vehicle downtown and uh, comes into the studio and. You know, cleans up the space, binds up a couple of books, sticks them in the press. Um, you know, comes back two or three days later, pulls them out of the press. I've already cleaned them up for him, right? So that you know, because sometimes he was overlooking little things like that. But I'd wipe them down, fit, uh, clean up any of the tight overstamping or whatever, and away he goes. He's super happy, right? Um, but uh, you know, as, as far as things go, like the the next generation of binders here um, they don't have the benefit of print shops having book binders everywhere no and they don't have the benefit of the equipment being available everywhere it's not like it's it's really difficult for people to get into this industry because like try and find a, a the tools aren't there anymore you know, it's not just the tools I mean you can buy hand tools yeah you can buy a bone folder you can buy you know the knives you can, you know, the little stuff you can do. Yeah. And you don't really need more than that to be a binder at home, right? As a, as a hobby or as a, as a, uh, you know, even if you're working from home and you're slowly over the years just collecting little tools and don't really have a book press or anything, you can still use a brick. Yeah. You know, a bunch of bricks or some old um, encyclopedias wrapped up in paper or something as you're pressing stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's like a lot of the equipment to do stuff on this level I inherited from the people before me and a lot of it I've had to hunt for over the years as well yeah like our paper drill is from the 50s and we've had to rewire it a couple of times hey brother hey uh, we've had to rewire it a couple of times we've had to have it fixed several times um, I've had a couple of shysters try and 
Screw us on the on the fixing. Oh, this one's toast. We can't find new parts. I've found new parts. I've found new parts, right? Um, or I've made my own new parts. Or I took it apart myself and fixed it and found out what the problem was. And they were just trying to sell me a more expensive machine. Absolutely. Things like that. So um, why replace what doesn't need to be replaced? But in other cases, like... Friends have invested in the business. I had one friend buy that printing press, had another friend buy the CNC machine, and although we're paying them back for it over time, I mean it's a loan. But you know, the the company has grown to basically not just because it's a necessity of equipment, but because these are things that will help take it into the next level of things. When people stop buying books like crazy, like there's always going to be repairs, always. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, books are not disappearing in so much as no, bookstores are disappearing. Kidding. Yes. And the reason why bookstores are disappearing is because people are buying their shit on the internet or going to ebooks. And, you know, I tell you, I haven't seen a Kobo or a, uh, a Kindle in public in ages. Nope. Right? I mean, people aren't even reading on their phones as much. So, yes, there are those people that will read and buy and have ebooks. But what I've noted is, in most cases, people are buying their books on the internet because of the convenience factor. It's right? yeah, convenience, but also just the simple fact that you can't. I can go to a book like look. I look in the city, right? I can't like. There's nothing like I live in Detroit. I, so there's so my favorite bookstore to go there was John King Books. It's it's a literally a six story warehouse yeah. of books, right? <laughs> I can't find that something like that with that kind of well, and access. Here in Calgary, I mean, there's yeah. there is a there is a, a charity bookshop, yep. something similar to that. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's a charity bookshop that gouges. Yes. Right. Because she bases her prices on the highest um, book scalper prices she can find on the internet. Right. When it comes to anything that, uh, yeah, is it rare? Well. It might be. I mean, a lot of these county books or township books or whatever are rare. They only printed a couple hundred of them at most. Sometimes only fifty or a hundred. But at the same time, when you have a an average price on the internet of like forty bucks and a book scalper price of like three hundred bucks, and she's taking the book scalper price and saying this is what it's worth. Well, no, it's not. Right. Oh, if I can get it for forty, why why would I, well, why would I pay three hundred for it? Is right. It's uh, it's whatever's right in front of you mm-hmm. and whatever you say it's worth. Right. If somebody haggles, then so be it. Right. Um, and, and, and but in stuff. places like this, I mean, um, the two bookshops that we host here, David's and my friend John's. Um, David's shop is an, a book experience, mm-hmm. and it's a beautiful experience because he, you know, I, I know he hates me using this word, but it's a curated collection. Yes, it is. Right? He picks everything because it's got some sort of interesting value, whether it's an odd book or a rare book or a scarce book or an interesting book or an intellectual book or just something that caught his eye and he thought it was really groovy. Um, I made it a point to hide a Harlequin romance on a shelf one day. It was an antique one. It's still here. Is it still here? I'm not surprised. It's pride of place. Yeah, pride of place. A Harlequin romance. Absolutely. But it's one of the pulp antiques, and I found it at a... At a Which one, if you don't mind my asking? Oh, I have no idea. I, yeah. You know, I just... I saw the cover. It was kind of slutty. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it had, it had you know, naughty scenes in it, which I don't care about. But I do know that the, the giggle factor is, is that, uh, you know, David's got these books that he's selected mm-hmm. because they caught his interest or because clients had an interest in those things, and he's... he's um, you know, kind of gearing things towards his audience, which is beautiful and fantastic, but at the same time, this is like a representation of his mind in a, in a lot of ways. That, I can see some psychology sort of thing in it, but at the same time, it's not, you know, it's not like uh, uh, him having a collection of botanical and garden books means that he enjoys gardening. No, no, no. Right? I, I, so, I, when I, when I, when I, oh, there you go. Yes. Thank you. What is it called? Nancy Craig RN. Nice. Oh, what is it? Uh, so, a Harlequin book complete and unabridged. You know, Harlequin is is the sort of epitome of um, 
boilerplate books. Like they're all basically the same thing. And my ex-wife wanted to write Harlequin books. She's not a good writer, right? But she wanted to write a Harlequin book and pay off her student loans or something. <laughs> now that said, they pay a crazy amount of money oh, to writers of the books if you write it within their within their paradigm and with you know some flair. And, 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 and it does and it does well, yeah. If they accept it, yeah. I mean, but at the end of the day, it's like they even give you the boilerplate on the internet. Right, just so that you can copy the the system and write it within these things and do it in this way. Um, I don't know how far they guide you along with the process, but I mean, is she creative? Yes. Is she intelligent? Yes. Like one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. She is she like a writer? I don't know, man. I've never seen her write anything. Right. So, ah. But is she capable? Probably. Oh, I, but I don't know how many people get away with writing romance novels. But this one was a pulp romance novel for thirty-five cents. It's it's even numbered three forty-two. Yes. Uh, oh, the eventful hospital career of Nancy Craig, R.N. Right. Certain nerds. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Harlequin Books, Toronto and Winnipeg. Um, first published August 1955, second edition September 1956, printed in Canada, and it's just dirty. It's dirty. Yeah, it's okay. It's around dirty. Dirty stuff. No, well, no. I mean, um, one of the books that I'm in the middle of planning. Like again, I've I, I write shorter things. You know, I don't yeah. write big novels or anything. But uh, the the short stories and the and the stuff. You know, after a while, I just dump it all because it never gets finished. It's just lots of neat ideas and lots of you know. I, I wrote a whole bunch of raps when I was angry back in 2009, and they turned into really awesome blues songs, nice. which we recorded, right? Um, but I mean, me being angry and angsty, and then turning it into blues songs. That's weird, you know. I mean, and it sounded great as a blues song. Well, still silly and stupid, but yeah, whatever. Okay. But these these stories. I mean, as far as as far as the humor and the, the the silliness of it all, like I just threw a few lines into this one story I'm writing called Cooch, right? And um, I thought that it's an interesting word. Yes. It's an interesting word in a very Bukowskian sort of way. Yeah. But does it mean, like, people will take that and reinterpret it in a, in a very leftist manner and say that I'm a woman hater, right? Because it's writing about the women who influenced my life in, you know, and the people in my world were not good people. You know, they were addicts, they were junkies, they were, they were assholes, they were violent, they were abusive, they were hateful, they were racists, they were... Uh, I think this is the only one, brother. Uh, unless from right. David's thing. Okay, no. Does it yours? Well, mine's gone. I don't know about yours. This one fell out, so I didn't want somebody to grab it and have it blow up in their face. Um, but that's the thing. It's like, uh, is, is that nasty? Well, they probably didn't use the word fuck in it. You know, one of my favorite words. They probably never used the word cunt, but it's again one of my favorite words. But in the grand scheme of things, I mean, it's uh, uh, it's a it's a naughty book. Yes. Right. Um, you know, I think uh, I think Harlequin takes the esoteric of romance and turns it into um, sort of a, a erotic light reading. You know, um, people were reading it on the on the bus. You know, when I was in grade three, I yeah, I wanted to read, and I just learned to read. Um, I was basically illiterate until grade three, because nobody took any interest in my education, right? And so I wasn't helped at home to read. I wasn't helped with anybody. You know, nobody was taking any part in my stuff until they got me a tutor, and so I didn't learn to read until the end of grade two, start of grade three. A teacher took the time and tutored me. Uh, they found me a tutor to walk me through the remedial stuff, teaching me stuff on the side, right? They, you know, I met I met the girl that was in the class with me because uh, they did lots of one-on-one -on -one and lots of little on-the-side stuff. But because they took the special time for us, because we were smart kids, all of us, but we weren't taken care of in a in a way that we could learn anything and so we fell behind and I never learned how to read and so should have should have I mean but I didn't and they had these people take us aside teach us how to read teach us how to understand things and 
they had essentially lied to us. They said, oh, you're genius kids. We're, you're so super smart. We have to take you aside and give you extra. Ah. Uh, okay. So they completely like lied to us. And from that point forwards, it was in my head. You're doing these great things. Keep it up. Right? You're learning interesting things. Keep it up. And so I was the only person in the next school I went to, grade three, the only person up to grade six, I believe, was when they started, like, they, they'd already dropped cursive at that time. So here I am writing in cursive, and nobody else could read it except for the teachers. Right? Because the other kids didn't read cursive, they read printing. And, you know, here I am in grade three reading a frickin' Harlequin romance novel. And the teacher says, I don't think that's appropriate for your age level. <laughs> that's awesome. Right? Yeah. And what was the next things they gave me? Like, Hardy Boys? I mean, that's just more tripe. Yep. You know, but I didn't know that at the time. So, here I am writing these ridiculous things. I don't think it reflects on who I am. Um, I, I'm sure that in the grand scheme of things... We all have a perspective of who we are. Mine is that, you know, I, I'm a hobbyist writer that writes crass. I've got a terrible sense of humor and make fun of everything. There's nothing sacred. Um, I swear a lot. I drink a lot. I do a lot of things that people shouldn't do. I smoke a pipe and smoke cigars and, you know, enjoy the company of awesome people. You comfortable on your skin? What's that? Are you comfortable on your skin? What skin? What? <laughs> I mean, am I comfortable with my skin? I, I am as I am. I can't change that. I've lost 60 pounds in the last year and still see a very obese person in the mirror. So that, you know, psychologically, I mean, you could interpret that in a lot of ways. I'm, you know, I've got body dysmorphia. I think that's what the term for it is. But so if it's just in there, just hallucinating something nasty about oneself doesn't make one nasty. No. Right? Um, you know, like I say, I spread a lot of rumors about myself, and I do it on purpose because I want to see what comes back. Uh-huh. And who, specifically, was the one passing it around. And that's part one of my conversation with Rob. Uh, Octavia Bookbinder, if you want your books restored, repaired, uh, their address is 1040 8th Avenue Southwest in Calgary. Um, you can definitely check them out. They open at 12 p.m. tomorrow, and that, that's their general hours for the week. You should definitely check that out. If you go on their Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Octavia Bookbindery, you can actually see them do some restorations now. It's actually really, really neat stuff. Um, definitely check them out. They're awesome. And that will do it for part one, and this episode of Just Joshing. You can support the podcast in a number of different ways. For starters, you can you know subscribe to it, whether it's Podomatic, Spotify, iTunes, or Google Play. I'm available at any of those those places. Definitely check me out there. My books, The Watcher, Storm Dancer, Wandering God, Curse of Mirror World Publishing.com. My YouTube channel, Joshua Pentelaresco, currently has 116 episodes for you to listen to. Feel free to check them out. Above all else, thanks for listening. Stay inspired. Have a great week. Try to stay warm in this freaking Siberian winter here if you're in Calgary. Um, but beyond all that, man, see you guys around. See you around next time. Josh. Josh.